Hello, we're about ready to start. Welcome to Martha Blakeney Hodges Special Collections and University Archives 50th Anniversary Speaker Series. I'm delighted to introduce two friends and colleagues for today's presentation, a conversation of note. Curators talk about the history of the UNCG cello music collection. Stacy Krim, curator of manuscripts and assistant professor, and William Nelson, cello music cataloger and associate professor. A bit about our speakers today. Stacy Krim is assistant professor and curator of manuscripts in the Martha Blakeney Hodges Special Collections and University Archives at UNCG Greensboro. I'm sorry, UNC Greensboro. She has curatorial responsibilities for the manuscripts collection and the cello music collection, collecting and providing access to the musical collections of cellists noted for their distinguished contributions in the areas of composition, performance, and pedagogy. These responsibilities include archival processing, research, support, donor relations, collection development, instruction, and community outreach and marketing. Associate Professor Mac Nelson has served as a faculty librarian at UNCG since 2006. He has primary responsibility for cataloging the cello music collection in the University Library's Martha Blakeney Hodges Special Collections and University Archives, where he collaborates regularly with curator of manuscripts, Stacy Krem, and has himself undertaken a number of special projects on behalf of the collection, including extensive video oral history interviews with legendary cellists and donors, Bernard Greenhouse and Laszlo Varga. Mac's recent joint projects with Stacy include the article, Hitting the Right Notes, Cataloging, Collections and Collaborative Communication, published in the Music Reference Services Quarterly, May 2020, and the presentation, Hyperkinetic, Hyperkinetic, connecting, I'm sorry, access to archival music collections, catalogs, finding age and social media, a presentation which gained national recognition as the 2017 winner of the Music Library Association's Best of Chapters Award. Mech holds an MA in Medieval Studies from the University of York, England, an MM in Guitar Performance from Appalachian State University, and an MLIS from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. Welcome, Stacy and Mac. Thank you, Kathleen. Forgot to unmute there for a minute. So today we're gonna to go, we're gonna to try to cover as much as possible. We're having a very informal conversation about the history of the cello music collection, a bit about what Mac and I do, um, share some of the gossipy stories behind the collection. And as we're going through, feel free to ask any questions or put comments in chat. Um, we'll be monitoring that. So let's go ahead and get started. So who do you, how, Mac, how do you think, what do you think the beginning of the cello music collection was, really? Well, um, I think the best answer to that uh, is the, the, the presence of Professor Elizabeth Cowling uh, on the faculty here for such a long time. And, uh, and increasingly, it seems, I mean, we don't have I don't think, Stacy. I don't think we have in her own words her vision of um, this becoming a cello study center. But she, um, this university, uh, Women's College and UNCG, but she did use that expression, did she not? Uh, I believe she did. Her vision, um, to give a bit of background, uh, to jump a little bit ahead of ourselves, is Elizabeth Cowling was a cellist, but she also was a music historian, and she wrote what was considered the definitive biography of the instrument called the cello um, at the time it was published in the 1970s. And to write that book, she traveled all over Europe, um, going to various archives to try to aggregate um, these obscure early cello works. So she really saw a centralized, she wanted to play a one-stop shopping archive essentially for cello music. Um, oh. You know, and uh, Elizabeth Cowling, she's really uh, quite interesting. She started here when we were a woman's college actually in the 1945, 1946 academic year. And she taught a variety of music courses. And if any of you are familiar with the uh, UNCG campus, she her house was roughly where um, the Walker parking deck is in that area. So, you know, every day I park where Elizabeth Cowling lived. 
And she was noted as a really wonderful, but a really tough teacher, right? Mm -hmm. And frequently when I, especially when I'm reading Elizabeth Cowling's book, I, I wish so frequently that I could have had a music course with her. But uh, I have found a quote from one of her students that was in her obituary, and it referred to her music history courses as being bone chillingly terrifying. Um, so I went through the collection and I actually found her, her grade book to show you and uh, to show you what, what those scores looked like. So I'm afraid I probably would have ended up like poor Coralie, um, but you can see Elizabeth Cowling was not an easy grader. She had a very high demand from her students um, that uh, she, she made them want to learn. Um, but that being said, she also um, was so absolutely beloved by her students. You know, Stacy, when, um... In, in speaking with their students, which uh, we both had uh, quite a wonderful opportunity to do back when we, we celebrated her life and legacy um, in, I believe it was 2011, the major, uh, was that right, Stacy? the date? I think so, but. I think so, yeah. Close, anyway. Um, one of the things that was so interesting is, and this moves us ahead just an inch or two, um, is often her students referred to the cello music collection as the Silva Library. Um, that's, it seems what they called it then. And of course, that's a reference to Luigi Silva, um, whom, uh, of whom we could, I mean, we could spend this entire hour on any number of our cellists alone. But uh, Silva, in, in which uh, Stacy will fill in um, plenty of gaps, but his relationship uh, with Cowling was as teacher friend and colleague very close. And uh, and I believe, Stacy, are you ready to move to Silva here? Because I think you can give some details, so jump in anywhere. Sure. Um, so um, Silva was one of the great 20th century Italian cellists, and you would probably hear more about him um, if he did not die at a relatively early age and he actually enjoyed, he did some recordings, major recordings, but he didn't like to record. Um, he felt that, and remember the recording industry was kind of new when he was uh, still kind of new to the major recording industry. He felt that uh, the sound of recordings to kind of took the soul out of his music and also did not allow for that important um, connection between the audience and the musician. So while there are some major recordings of Silver, there aren't many. And he immigrated to the United States in the 1930s. Um, like many of the cellists in our collection, um, he represents one of the immigrants who came to the United States uh, during a time of political upheaval in Europe. Um, and that's gonna be the story you're gonna see for many of the early years of our cellist. Silva, uh, so Elizabeth Cowling first met Silva in the late 1940s, early 1950s. And she had just come away from studying with Casals in Europe. So she uh, got the, the invitation to meet Silva in New York and she was so absolutely excited. So she packs her suitcase and, and go, takes the train to New York doesn't even check into her hotel room. So she has her suitcase in hand and she goes to Silva's hotel room to, to meet him because she's so excited. And as she's talking to Silva, she's asking all sorts of questions about his style of performance. And she keeps saying things like, well, Casal said this, well, Casal did this. And in a very short time, he got so angry with her, he basically dumped her in her suitcase outside of his hotel room. So that first meeting didn't go well, but they ended up reconciling later and uh, eventually had a very uh, good relationship. So the whole Silva, um, Silva Casals issue, the reason that came about was that um, 
because Silva, when he was a child, was taken by his parents to meet Casals to see if he, Casals would teach him to be a cellist. And Casals took one look at Silva's hands and said, you don't have, your hands are basically too small to be one of the great cellists. Um, so Silva uh, basically devoted his life to proving Casals wrong, and he did. Silva was one of the great cellists of Italy. And um, Silva devoted a lot of his time to translating Italian violin pieces for the cello, um, as well as coming up with a tremendous treatise that we actually have digit digitized and online devoted to his left hand technique, right, Mac? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And Silva's style was, was really unique, right? Absolutely, in fact. Uh, we can have a little um, musicological, music historical window on the Silva collection by uh, reflecting from uh, around 2010, uh, a wonderful presentation that was given here um, by then uh, musicologist Paolo Polzinetti and then cello um, professor uh, Brooks Whitehouse. Um, and I won't go into all the detail, but what it suggests is something that is, is uh, pervasive in the collection. And that is what they explored was Luigi Silva, who was also a student of Ottorino Respighi, um, the, the famous Italian uh, composer who was um, central in the uh, neoclassical revival of Italian music. We hear a, a great deal about French neoclassicism of that period, uh, but the Italians uh, were, were busy with it too. And in fact, uh, what this presentation did, and this amplifies Stacy's earlier point, the presentation compared uh, the fingerings, and luckily we had recordings, both the fingerings and recordings in the Haydn, I believe it was the D major concerto. Um, the uh, uh, first, the Casals, uh, and in the opening when the, when the cello enters this extraordinarily comparatively uh, romantic, uh, we could be more specific than that, but then I would really um, uh, get digressive, um, this very romantic approach to the music shift to Luigi Silva's recording and also to his fingerings, which you can see right here in, in the cello music collection. Um, and you have a much more restrained uh, uh, approach, a clearly a very classically oriented approach, um, full of life, but not full of the um, interpretive qualities we associate with romanticism and also with that huge sweeping sound of Pablo Casals. So that's a window on, that's a window on a musicological subject that awaits the right scholar right here to continue talking about the place of Luigi Silva in, um, Italian, neo, in the Italian neoclassical tradition. Yes, and so Silva's collection was per, w arrived here in 1963, and it was the only purchase collection. It is the only purchase collection that we actually uh, currently have in our collection. And how that came about is uh, Silva died in 1961, and his widow put the collection up for sale, and Elizabeth Cowling found out about it. So Elizabeth Kelling went to our Friends of the Library group to see if they would be willing to purchase this collection for us, and they did. So um, in 1963, Elizabeth Cowling and uh, our, our university library, and at the time, took the library uh, station wagon and I'm a bit envious that the library had a st station wagon. It must have been one of those huge 1950s ones because this collection is really, really big. 
and they drove up to New York to meet Silva's widow and pack the collection. And Mac and I certainly know, uh, know what the, the collection road trips are like. So this is the, um, the contract that you see Elizabeth, that's Elizabeth Cowling's handwriting that she wrote for the purchase of the collection, which ultimately cost $3,000. Um, so that was a lot of money back in 1963. And uh, it was impressive that our library invested in, Friends of the Library allowed to be us to invest in that. So they go up to meet Silva's widow and they meet at um, Luigi Silva's uh, apartment. And they're packing the collections uh, and the librarian goes to uh, look at the desk to see what, what hasn't been packed yet. And he found, finds Silva's Baccarini manuscripts. Um, and apparently uh, Silva's widow had been potentially hiding those. So when, she, when this librarian found those, she um, got very upset and fainted and they had to stop what they were doing to, to wake her up. And um, eventually she agreed to sell those Baccarini manuscripts, but she held on for them a bit longer. And it was uh, only through the intercession of Jano Schulz, who we're gonna talk about a bit later, that we were able to obtain those manuscripts. So the Silva, found, the Silva collection became the foundation for the UNC collection, UNCG Cello Music collection. And to this day, I still get uh, phone calls and emails asking about the Silva library as a whole. Silva was so well known that he, um, his, his reputation is really what would attract the uh, later collections to be donated here. Um, so after Silva, uh, who um, the collection came here in 1963, Elizabeth Cowling donated her collection in 1977. So those are the first two collections. And then we move on to Rudolf Motz. Um, now Rudolf Motz is a really, really fabulously interesting character. And I'm gonna actually, I had a student who did a, um, a digital exhibit on him a few years ago. I'm gonna go ahead and put that in chat. So Rudolf Motz was from um, Yugoslavia, which eventually became Croatia. And he was a Renaissance man, really. He um, was a poet, he wrote, he was an athlete, he was a musician. Um, he was just one of those unstoppable forces. And you can see um, very nice technique. Rudolf Motz was very, very well known in his time as, uh, as a expert in studying the um, physicality of performance. So he was kind of the early, um, early, what is it? Uh, Alexander method in his country. He actually pioneered the study of musical therapy in his country. He also um, was the record holder in his country for, I believe, the 200 meter dash. Uh, and he's held several um, national records in his youth. He was actually preparing for the, I think it was the 1923 Olympics when he in for uh, track and field, when he injured himself. And it was after that, that he devoted a lot of his life to more of his life to music. So the story behind Rudolf Motz and, and Rudolf Motz also is the only cellist in our collection who didn't uh, from Europe, who did not immigrate to the United States. And uh, Mac and I had the opportunity to talk to his student who was the one actually who got us this collection not too long ago. And uh, because this is something I've always felt a little bit guilty about, we have one of the greatest musical icons in Croatia here at UNCG, his collection. His, uh, his apartment is a museum in Zagreb. Um, so I feel like I'm, I'm poaching a national treasure from another country. <laughs> uh, and I asked his student who was also uh, Croatian, Yugoslavian, who, how he felt. Um, and he felt that Matz's collection was in great danger 
of being sucked up into private collectors. And he wanted to make certain it was going to be accessible to the public forever. So that's why he brought it here. So Mott's, uh, in, in Yugoslavia and Croatia, they were in his time dealing with the rise of communism. And Mott's probably, if kind of the Nazi communist puppets of the government hadn't uh, taken over, he probably would have gone as far as a cultural ministry position in his country. But the politics of that region really suppressed his influence. And um, so by the time the wars had ended and he might have had a chance for leaving, if he could have made it out of the communist government, he would have been in his 50s or 60s and he felt he was too old for that. But he was a very well-known teacher. He also conducted several, uh, several orchestras and choruses in that region. And as he was aging, um, there were a lot of uh, private collectors who were circling around his collection. Um, and there was also a fear that maybe his music was not um, really the best communist propaganda. Maybe it didn't align as much with the regime. So there was a fear his collection would either be stolen or destroyed or purchased. So his student, who was actually the owner of Dominus Music, um, smuggled the the collection out in his suitcases and managed to make it out, got to Canada and drove the collection down to Greensboro. And that is how we got the collection. There are over 300 original compositions in this collection, as well as a substantial portion of personal papers. Um, yes, it is Indiana level collecting. Um, and uh, I've had, uh, he's Mats has really experienced a renaissance in the past several years. So I've had quite a few people come in to do research in his collection. I'm still waiting for the person who can actually come in and, and work with his personal papers because the form of um, the, the Slavic form he dealt with, the alphabet's a bit antiquated. So it's a bit harder for people to read, but his is a, a magnificent collection. Um, and in, in terms of um, adding credibility to the UNCG cello music collection, he was an excellent third addition to the collection. So from there, we moved on to Marie Seisenberg. So, uh, Matz's collection came in 1988, so we're having like one collection arrive a, a, a decade, keep that in mind at this time, um, one or two. Eisenberg's collection was donated in, 18, in uh, 1989. So Maurice Eisenberg was uh, very well known as one of the great students of Pablo Casals, and um, he was born in Poland. Uh, his family moved to the United States. Of course, uh, his, his father was a rabbi um, and being a Jewish family in Poland, early 1900s, you wanna, <laughs> you don't wanna stick around um, with the rise of anti-Semitism. So when he came to the United States uh, and with his interest of in music, he actually, um, became principal of the New York Symphony Orchestra. I don't think it was um, the Metropolitan Orchestra yet. And I think he was 20 or 21. He was very, very young when he became principal. Mm -hmm. uh, but to be fair, back then there weren't, the cello music world was a very small world and there weren't that many major cellists in the United States. Um, in 1923, even though he was in this principal position, he had the opportunity to go and study with Pablo Casals. So he uh, took that opportunity. And of course, if any of you are not aware of who Pablo Casals is, Pablo Casals is basically the uh, musician who popularized the cello for the 20th century. He's kind of the, the cello music god, so to speak. Um, so definitely time with Casals, was time well spent. And here's a picture of Eisenberg with Casals. And Casals was going through a kind of a depressive time uh, during this. So he credited Eisenberg as helping him work out 
of that period. And that's really important. Um, Eisenberg's collection very much represents kind of a, a French influence. He would eventually take over the Casals class at the Paris Conservatory. Um, and eventually he would also start the London International, was it the London International Cello School in London, something like that. He also taught in, um, in Portugal. Um, so, and he did the, the usual rounds of the conservatories in, um, in the United States. What I like about Eisenberg's collection is he has just some, in, not all of his collection is like this, but he has just some in, insanely annotated pieces where he has just written uh, essays on it. And this is what Mac and I love to see. And I know that there's a great deal of uh, disagreement about how much a piece, your, your sheet music should be annotated in the cello music world. But when you think in terms of the historic record, this is what tells Mac and I exactly what someone was thinking, where their fingers and bows were at any moment. Um, so this piece was actually digitized. You can find it in our digital collection. And uh, this is just wonderful also because it has this nice page turn, dam turn damage, which we like to see to know that um, the piece has been used, it has been performed from, and of course, Maurice Eisenberg's stamp. My one of my favorite Eisenberg stories, uh, and it's only tangentially related to Eisenberg, was um, I had the opportunity a few years ago uh, to speak over the phone with Maurice Eisenberg's daughter, who was the one who ultimately donated the collection. And uh, Casals used to come and live with them um, for long periods of time when they were in France. And uh, where, where Eisenberg and his family lived in France, um, it was kind of rural, so there was their house, and then in between the, there was a, and it was close to the seashore, and in between the house and the seashore, there was a cow pasture. And Maurice Eisenberg's daughter was, wanted to go to the beach, but she was terrified of the cows. So whenever Casals visited, she, he would take her by the hand and walk her through the cow pasture, so that way, um, she would be protected from the cows and could go play on the beach. And I love the, the idea of that, of, of Casals being the, um, the protector of little girls from cows, <laughs> from mean cows. Um, so Eisenberg's collection arrived in 1989. And after that, in 1994, we get Jana Scholz. And Mac, can you tell me an interesting trivia an interesting bit of trivia related to Jana Scholz. Sure, um, and and I will. I want to, and I and I won't go back to it now. But at some point, I want to talk a little bit about annotations. But let me um, answer your question first. I think, um, and tell me if I've got the trivia right. Um, the in when I was growing up, maybe when many of us were growing up. If you asked for a famous cellist, people could probably, most people, now great music lovers and cellists could name many, but your average um, person on the street would immediately say Pablo Casals. They might say Gregor Piatigorsky, uh, maybe a couple of others if they're really good. But nowadays, you ask that question, I think everybody knows what your answer would be. And the, the answer would be Yo-Yo Ma. Am, am I warm with, with your anecdote, uh, you Stacy? You are. Yes. Uh, in fact, Stacy's got the evidence here, and I guess uh, it's in the last paragraph that you will see a recommendation uh, to Scholes of a very young, as you say, or as it says, um, he is terribly serious has apparently an enormous gift of what to say, a concentration, uh, plays uh, Bach to stay and otherwise is a very cheerful and jolly little boy. And that is the household name, the very, very young um, Yo-Yo Ma, who studied with uh, Schultz in, in New York, right, Stacey? Um. That is correct. Um, so Yo-Yo Ma's father uh, 
was worked for a uh, music school. Yo-Yo Ma is amazing on so many levels, and he has done so much for for this instrument and for music in general. Um, so uh, what little parts Jana Scholz may have contributed to that, we are exceptionally grateful. Um, but that's a great example of how important it is at times you don't, when you're processing material, you kind of don't want to look at every single letter that you're reading because it will take forever. But Yo-Yo Ma's did, uh, name did not appear anywhere on that. It's just his father. So if I wasn't paying close attention, I would have missed it. And when I actually found that letter, I pretty much ran out into the hallway and had to tell everyone in my department that I found the letter. And they were like, that's nice, Stacy." <laughs> um, <laughs> but... Um, so we have we have Yano Scholz in some part to thank for for Yo Yo Ma. Um, so Yano Scholz uh, was originally from Hungary. Uh, his he was uh, a graduate of the um, Franz Liszt Academy, like so many of the great cellists, and uh, of of Hungary. And he was principal of the Budapest Symphony, and then joined the Ross Quartet. And here you can see Yano Scholz. When he joined the Roth Quartet, he toured the world. And if you're interested in their performances, you can find a lot of their performances on, um, on YouTube, actually. And he eventually settled in the United States and in New York. Uh, and he was this tremendous, not only was he a great musician, he also, uh, of the cello, he also played the viola da gamba. And he was the first musician to record the Bach Gamba sonatas on the original, on the historic instrument. Um, so he was uh, kind of at the head of the re revitalization of historical performance. Um, and he had his own, he had an antique bow collection. He would frequently lecture on musical iconography and art at several universities. So he was this just amazingly well-rounded, educated, um, person in addition to being a, a fine cellist. Um, and the, his bow collection ultimately ended up going to the Smithsonian and we uh, were the beneficiaries of getting his cello music collection. Um, in the 1990s in recognition of his help uh, and assistance in getting us the final portion of the Silva collection, he actually was given an honorary degree, uh, PhD, by our university. So this is him at, at that ceremony. Uh, so he has had a tremendous influence on our collection. Uh, his collection was also the first to have a really, really huge personal papers portion. Uh, and it helped me really appreciate how many different languages musicians, classical musicians, especially of a certain time spoke, um, because uh, I, you had to jump around four or five languages in the correspondence at a given time. Um, and he was the first of our Hungarian cellist, although we would at, have added uh, many, many more. I sometimes feel like we have a, a special tie to Hungary because we're, we're always incorporating more of their cellist in our, to our collection. So um, Scholz, the addition of Scholz was a, a great aspect, as, asset to us. He also, as a collector, collected historic music. So there were a lot of um, rare pieces from the 1700s in his collection that were really, really fine condition in fine condition. So it's always a pleasure to go through his collection and stop and look at those pieces. After Scholz, we uh, actually start entering uh, the, the years around the time Max starting, more or less, um, to some degree. So after Scholz, we acquired the collection of Fritz Mog, uh, and that arrived in 2002. Do you want to talk a bit about uh, Fritz Mog, Mac? Sure, I'll be happy to. Um, yes, Fritz Mog, which I'll always remember, is collection number six, um, because it, when I arrived here, I followed uh, uh, a series of catalogers, but I was the, I was the first um, full-time cello music cataloger. And uh, my predecessor, who was very close to Mog, um, uh, allowed me to be the first to catalog. We worked on it together at first. 
and then I cataloged the Mog collection. Uh, Fritz Mog was Viennese. He was uh, a precocious child, became principal cellist of the Vienna Orchestra by 20, maybe 21. Um, and as Stacy's already pointed out, as is the case with so many of our cellists, his European career in his native country was quickly cut short um, by the Nazi menace. Um, and he fled to uh, the United States and um, was primarily known for his long, very productive career as a pedagogue uh, at Indiana University in Bloomington, um, where I believe he taught from 48, 1948 to 1984, if I've got it right. That one's easy to remember because you just reversed the last two numbers. But he had a long career there alongside Jano Starker, of whom much more later. Um, but um, Mag was uh, absolutely revered by his, his students. Um, and uh, um, among our cellists, uh, his is the career that ha has generated somewhat fewer anecdotes. He was a very reserved uh, um, and uh, elegant human being. Uh, but we really love two things about Fritz Mog. One is that if you borrowed his music to make a copy, he waited for you to bring it back. So compared to many of the other collections, we have pretty much complete copies of everything uh, that, uh, we, we may have lots of photocopies in the collection itself, but we don't have that many partial um, scores, which is really nice. The other thing is that Fritz Mog was, uh, you've already seen uh, Eisenberg's annotations, uh, Fritz Mog might hold the record uh, for copious annotations in the prelude to the sixth box suite. I don't know whether we have that one in, in, the, in our lineup, uh, Stacy, but you can see in his uh, Alexanian edition, I believe it's that one, where he's carefully annotated the um, sixth prelude, which of course cellists know it very well. All of the cello Preludes are a Bach are great elaborate in, uh, introductory movements of the suites, and they get bigger and bigger. And the sixth suite is the crowning. Mm -hmm. There we are. Um, as Mog annotated, he eventually ended up making his own manuscript copy. And speaking of manuscript, you can see here at the head and at the foot, top and bottom of this, you can see Mog's manuscript additions beginning to develop. Um, and uh, then he eventually wrote out his own manuscript and annotated that. And that one may be the most heavily annotated. This one is equally heavily annotated. And it's actually a little less intimidating because there's a little more space between uh, uh, the staffs. So uh, that was characteristic of Mog. And let me slip just briefly into the whole business of annotation and manuscript additions, because it's key uh, in the history of this collection from the very beginning, uh, this library committed itself to item level cataloging of the collection. And that sounds a little technical. What it means is that each item in the entire collection has its own record. Um, and that enables the cataloger to be really specific for the scholar. So when you get in our catalog and you're looking for those box suites, you're going to know which ones are annotated and which ones are not. Um, and Stacy and I, we can't go into this today, but Stacy and I have presented extensively on the extent that the item level cataloging with the detailed notes, that's my primary job to provide, that actually plays as our greatest strength in the age of the super search engine. Um, our items, because of the, the, the metadata in the cataloging records, 
that the catalogers before me provided and that I now provide uh, bumps our materials right to the top of the searches. And of course, that's where the students and the researchers and the cellists of all varieties get into the catalog. And the next thing you know, Stacy's got her hands on their searches and uh, the rest is history. Um, they, they, they find this absolute treasure trove. Um, so that's a little description of how important item level cataloging is to the kind of access that this massive collection uh, provides. Now, another window, what you see in front of you now, this is more of Fritz Mog. Uh, this is a, um, uh, a composition by Juan Orrego Salas. And I'm just going to give you a brief window on what it represents. Um, we hear all the time of artists and composers working together. Uh, Bernie Greenhouse with Elliot Carter, working together on the Carter Sonata, a very famous piece. This is not yet a famous piece. I don't know whether it will become one, but the reason I have it in front of you is not simply because it's annotated, but because it is a demonstration. It wasn't clear at first to me what was going on when I opened this, but you can see the red uh, writing, you can see the manuscript editions. And if you look on the first page, you'll see a black Roman numeral two with the word Allegretto, the tempo marking Allegretto beneath it. And in red, you see an arrow and it says start. Well, this is actually page four of a 14 page composition. We are on page four still in the first movement, but this is where the secret comes out. Juan Orrego Salas was working closely at Indiana with Fritz Mog, and right there where it says in red capital letters start, Mog is saying, okay, let's cut or pause the first movement here. In fact, let's start a new movement. Let's cut your first movement in half and let's change the tempo. Essentially, it seems what Mog was saying, the first movement's too long, and it's too much, it's, it, the tempo is too regular. Um, we need something else here. And that's the key because you can see all over the place, the additions uh, that, and the revisions that um, Mog has made. Now, how do I know that this goes 14 pages? How did I know as a cataloger that Orego Salas, the composer, published this version, the version that Mog um, developed as he worked through the piece with the composer. It was published about 10 years later, and I was able to access the published version, and it's very clear that Juan Orego Salas accepted all of the performer's uh, suggestions, and the published piece really reflects heavily the influence of the performer, the great cellist uh, Fritz Mach. That's the kind of project you scholars and budding scholars will find here. There are a lot, there are many like this, but we fairly rarely get to see the evidence of collaboration between performer and composer to that extent. Right. Um, and after Mog, who actually, um, he had like the most insanely, wonderfully, beautifully annotated music we had seen up to that time. Um, his collection was actually smaller um, than a lot of our other collections, though, but the, the richness of the annotations was just amazing. After Mog, um, we have arriving two cellists collections who are very near and dear to our heart, especially Mac, who got to, to meet them and work with them extensively. First, we have Bernard Greenhouse and then Laszlo Varga. Right. And Stacy, feel free to cut me off because this is where um, I could be terribly long-winded, uh, given the fact that um, when I first arrived here at UNC Greensboro, this gentleman you see, uh, Bernard Greenhouse, uh, was being celebrated. He had actually attended the Luigi Silva uh, celebration, which was, a, you know, a three-day long weekend with 
you know, with, with um, one star cellist who was a student of Silva or an associate of Silva uh, coming through. Um, Bernie Greenhouse was here. He was about to turn 90. And in, um, uh, in, in, in the year 2006, he had made his uh, decision to donate his collection to the um, uh, cello music collection here at UNCG. And we had yet another gala uh, event, three, uh, three days of extraordinary cellists celebrating Bernard Greenhouse and listening to, you know, it wasn't just, uh, well, Bernie actually surprised us with two, with two performances on that occasion. He was 90 years old, uh, nearly, or he was going blind at the time, uh, and uh, he was not billed to perform, but um, you couldn't keep that guy down. He, he was extraordinary. Of course, let me back up a second. I've left out his primary claim to fame. There, he has many as a soloist even, but his primary claim to fame is as the uh, founding cellist of the Beaux-Arts Trio. I think right behind me, you can see a poster of the Beaux-Arts Trio. Um, certainly, arguably, maybe conclusively, we could, we could talk about that a long time. Uh, the most important uh, uh, piano trio of the last half of the 20th century. I'm sure um, uh, cellists out there have their favorites and their opinions, and it would be fun. But the, um, I mean, be fun to, to discuss, but this was his primary, this is his legacy. Uh, his son-in-law, Nicholas Del Banco, has, has written an entire book on the Beaux-Arts Trio. Um, anyway, so that I won't get bogged down into the details, let me just return to the celebration and say that his very famous cello, the um, uh, ex Paganini Countess of Stanline Stradivari cello, um, a mouthful, had just been restored. And his son-in-law, the, the great novelist, uh, Nicholas Del Banco, had written an entire book length study uh, um, of just the restoration of that cello. And here at UNCG, when the, uh, in the opening event and the alumni, um, okay, in the alumni house, uh, uh, Bernie unveiled the cello, Nicholas read from the book and Bernie played a bit of Schumann. That was the first. And then in the closing event, Bernie uh, played the, the, the song, the, well, I call it song, the piece known as Song of the Birds. Pablo Casals immortalized it and it was, uh, it was um, dear to Bernie's heart, and he was able to play that at the end of the celebration. Um, much more about Bernard Greenhouse, but we must move on, I think. So it was at the, and correct me if I'm wrong, at the Greenhouse celebration that Varga decided to donate his collection, correct? That's it. And here, um, I've done extensive oral histories with both Greenhouse and uh, Varga at their homes, in their studios, uh, Greenhouse uh, in Wellfleet. <laughs> There's Varga asleep on the plane. I, I spent two long sessions with Laszlo Varga, with the great videographer as well, in um, uh, his home in Florida. Um, but that's, you know, that's, that's terrific. Well, in a nutshell, which is not my forte, but I'll do my best. Uh, in a nutshell, when um, uh, when the greenhouse celebration was about to happen, uh, and here I give a shout out, shout out to um, uh, music library and Sarah Dorsey, and um, then also then um, cello professor uh, Brooks Whitehouse. They were looking for somebody to be Varga's escort, which really meant somebody to keep him in line. He was known to uh, get into trouble here and there, and I discovered I discovered a lot about that. But I spent three days driving him around, walking with him. Uh, and indeed, there were many times I had to redirect him, uh, even walking right into our library, into special collections. The first thing he saw in a wonderful exhibit at the Greenhouse Collection was an annotated copy of uh, 
uh, Virgil Thompson's cello concerto, and it was annotated by Bernard Greenhouse, who was closely associated with that music. It might have been dedicated to him, I can't remember. However, the minute Laszlo laid eyes on it, he was no fan of that piece, and he lit into it. And uh, I had to, uh, I had to kind of get him out in the lobby and calm him down a little bit. Um, uh, and that was my weekend with Laszlo Varga. Um, and just to wrap it up, since uh, Laszlo at that event, um, he he was he was very very thrilled with everything. And that was that event, not just uh, my time with him. I helped a little bit, but that event was the event that caused Laszlo Varga who was principal cellist under first Metropolis and then uh, long under Leonard Bernstein at uh, the um, New York Phil. Uh, Laszlo Varga decided in 2006 to donate his collection. Uh, and as you see, Stacy talked about one, one collection per decade. Well, now we're on a roll. They're beginning to roll in faster and faster. Uh, and Varga really contributed to that momentum, and we celebrated him, as you see on the screen, we celebrated Laszlo Varga in that very next year when he donated his collection in 2007, we had here at UNCG, the Varga celebration. Yeah, I mean, we we have been getting in so many collections in the recent years, we're, we're not even going to be able to cover half of them. <laughs> But um, this is a great picture uh, because it's foreshadowing one of our most recent collections as well. On the right side, uh, that is Janusz Starker. And in uh, at the end of 2019, we also um, were able to acquire his collection and it's currently being processed. And uh, actually, Mac, you were able to, um, to, to be his chauffeur. You're the chauffeur of many great cellists at some time or another. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, it was terrific because, and of course, his reputation uh, preceded him. Starker was, a, a, you know, a famous terror. Uh, it was cello students who had the most to be afraid of. But as his driver for three days during the uh, Varga celebration, uh, I was wary. Now, it's important really quickly. Uh, Varga and Starker have amazing parallel lives. Uh, they were both born in Budapest right at the same time. They studied with the same professors. Um, they both suffered the Nazi menace, uh, uh, had family members, and uh, Varga himself spent uh, quite a long time as a prisoner of the Nazis in labor camps. Uh, that in itself we, uh, is, is, is a long story. But both of them managed, they survived, they came to the US, they landed in New York, and at one point, Starker was principal cellist at the Metropolitan Opera, while his um, childhood friend Varga was principal at New York Phil. Well, Starker came to celebrate with his old friend, Laszlo Varga, and the story I bet Stacy has in mind, I walked in the O. Henry Hotel. Of course, I knew exactly, you can take one look at Jana Starker, He's impossible to mistake. You can spot him anywhere. Um, but he didn't know me from, from Adam. So in I came, and as if uh, Starker liked this analogy, I said, as if the gods were watching over us on the music system of the lobby, on comes the hide and C major uh, cello concerto. Well, I stopped and looked, wondering who had hit the switch. And I saw Starker spot me and he pointed to me. He knew who his driver was because I knew that music. But he then held me off. He put up his hand and held it up like this. And I stood there about 10 feet from him and we listened until uh, the cellist had had its first lengthy say. And then he motioned me over and he didn't say hello. He didn't say, he didn't introduce himself. He looked straight at me and he said about that performance. He said, I quote, not bad, but not me. And he, that's the kind of, 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 of character uh, that he introduced. I think I've got to stop my stories there, Stacy. We've got to move on. Yeah, as you can see, we have a whole bunch of stories. We could just go in. We, we actually cut quite a bit out. 
Um, and of course, Lynn Harrell is our most recent addition. Um, uh, that's that's definitely um, a heart wrenching one for Mac, but um, Mac and I. But we're we're processing his collection as quickly as possible, and it looks absolutely awesome. So um, in summary, and perhaps we will do a part two at some point since we only made it halfway through um, with even more wonderful stories. Um, if you wanna get in contact with us, we have a variety of ways you can, especially if you wanna access the collection, a good way to do that is by contacting our departmental account, scua at uncg.edu. And if you, uh, are on Facebook, you're welcome to contact me through Facebook, um, which uh, you can direct message me or on Twitter. So um, with that, does anyone have any questions? <laughs> I, so I suspect it's going to be Library of Congress for Yo-Yo Ma, I, I suspect, yeah. How yeah. long does it take to get a hold of an item? Um, if I can scan it, it's not going to take too long. So maybe a few days. Um, there's some material, of course, I cannot scan because of copyright issues or size. Uh, and in those cases, you would have to come in to physically access the archive. But if you look back at chat, um, I think Patrick posted, we do have a number of items digitized. We are, our great digitization team is going to be hopefully adding more in the coming year. So so there, we will have even a greater amount of uh, free material for you online. How do I use these collections in classes? So what's interesting about the cello music collection is that it gets used in classes not only for music, but also for um, other courses. Uh, as Mac mentioned, we have um, three Holocaust survivors presently represented. So for history classes, especially Lev Aronson's collection, who was the ninth collection, and we just missed um, being able to get to him, we uh, have two pieces that are signed with his camp number, as well as pieces he wrote in the American Militarized Zone of Berlin talking about his experience. So we use um, some of these pieces in more generalized classes. We also use them in teaching um, how to do primary source research for music studies. We have a great DMA program here and performance is our specialization in our School of Music. So being able to give uh, students hands-on research experience on how they can access music in archives is really critical and been uh, really useful, I think, to many of our students. So philharmonics don't necessarily call me for advice on how to perform a piece, but we definitely get a lot of requests uh, for rare pieces um, or hard to find pieces from orchestras and uh, symphonies throughout the world. That's pretty normal for us. Um, and I, I think um, each orchestra usually will have its own library, so they're usually pretty savvy when it comes to searching. But one thing I've been seeing more lately is um, orchestras who are looking for adaptations for smaller ensembles, um, which is something we do have represented in our collection. Um, and it may be the only copy in the world, and that's the way it tends to be in our collection. So uh, being able to provide that, those to orchestras is, is really quite wonderful. How much familiarity with cellos and cello music did both of us have? So I'll get started. I am not a musician or a musicologist, but I knew what the cello was and I have heard, heard cello music. Um, but I would say I uh, was probably the most ignorant of the, definitely the most ignorant of the two of us. So it was quite the learning curve for me to, um, to become literate in cello music literature. My um, primary instruments, uh, classical guitar, and by the time I was introduced to the cello, um, which was uh, when the Pablo Casals recordings of the six suites, uh, I should say to the solo cello, um, the six suites came out. In high school, I almost switched to the cello. Guitarists and cellists share a lot of repertory, including those suites. Um, and when I heard the soaring phrasing of Pablo Casals, um, I was in love with the cello. 
Uh, but I never took a cello lesson until much, much later. And I took a few. And I would love to be a good cellist. Um, I'm not. Uh, but I do know my way around the instrument um, and spent some time with, with the graduate student cellist here at UNCG studying for a short time, primarily with an eye toward uh, understanding this, not, not only the structure of the instrument, but the annotations and the vocabulary of the, the instrument itself and the music written for it. So that's how much I know. Um, uh, my, but my performing instrument is classical guitar. I'm afraid I'm going to have to um, be mindful of the time and um, just thank y'all for being here today. Thank you to the speakers and thank you so much for those of you who attended. I want to also mention that our next presentation in the series will be on April 7th at noon, where we'll have Dr. Christopher Hodgkins, Professor of Renaissance Literature and Atlantic World Studies Director speaking about, um, well, his topic is, I want books extremely, George Herbert and the soul of the library. And we hope to see y'all then. So thank you again to everybody and good afternoon.